Technology facilitated child exploitation, including trafficking, has been the driver for much of the innovation behind most digital forensics tools. Here with the Forensic Focus podcast to provide a customer perspective on that is Detective Lee Beaver of the Plantation Florida Police Department and the FBI's Crimes Against Children and Human Trafficking Task Force in Miami. I'm your podcast host, Krista Miller. Welcome, Detective Beaver. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I'd like to start with a little bit about you. How did you come to digital forensics and in particular crimes against children and human trafficking? So I've been a detective for about 20 years now, or I'd say a law enforcement officer for 20 years and been a detective for about 10 years. Um, As a detective, I started in property crimes and then kind of moved into or transitioned into sex crimes. Uh, I was recruited for ICAC human trafficking by my captain because he knew that I had a background in computers. I did some uh, computer, uh, I guess, projects at the police department. And he was happy with that and thought it would be a good transition for me. So that's how I got into ICAC. I've now been doing ICAC, I'd say, probably about for ICAC HT for about eight years. Okay. I, I was going to say property crimes into sex crimes is quite a transition. So I was curious how that happens. You know, yeah. When you get into a uh, criminal investigation division, you kind of go where they put you. And okay. I kind of transitioned to that and, and it just, you know, kind of moved me into uh, ICAC HT from there. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I, I noticed um, in your bio, you've also worked with the vice intelligence and narcotics unit at your agency. Um, I can imagine there's a lot of overlap with human trafficking in particular. Um, and I wanted to get into like what digital evidence artifacts or trends do you see now that you didn't see when you started? And where do you think those trends appear to be headed from here? So when I first started, I've been in vice intelligence and narcotics for approximately uh, probably eight years now. And when I started, obviously, the phones were coming about, uh, you know, not everybody had the uh, phones as much or used them as the smart device they are now. But um, there was a nice transition between the two uh, from that point. And uh, what I noticed is that uh, the phones have now become uh, such an integral part of everybody's life, uh, not only for uh, people who are just, you know, following the law, but for, for everybody. Yeah. And what I find is that uh, people that are doing criminal activity rely on their phones as well. And there's a lot of information that we can utilize to help us solve these cases. So um, one of the things that I noticed with uh, ICAC and HT investigations is the use of direct, direct messaging applications. Uh, they seem to be, as these direct messaging applications come out, they're utilizing them. Obviously, they're trying to use them uh, the with ones that have encryption on them yeah. uh, to try to give them anonymity and hide what they're doing or concealing what they're doing. The use of uh, VPN applications too. Uh, again, trying to uh, have anonymity. Uh, another thing is uh, with a lot of these cases, uh, using digital currency seems to be a big trend now. Yes. Uh, using these applications to uh, you know, send money back and forth, either whether it be from the client to the uh, or, or from the uh, victim, to, I should say, to the uh, conspirator or, or, or the suspect, but the money is flowing and there's ways to track that. The way they travel now with applications, that's another thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes now with, it's not like taxis, they use Ubers and other things. Well, those are all app-based. So there's a lot of good um, stuff out there, data that we can track other than the communications in the phone. Uh, right. Because one thing the phone has that's really good, even with the trends, is not only way they communicate uh, with other people through these devices, but how they communicate uh, with the device itself. Mm-hmm. And that shows us a lot as well when we're looking at these cases. Yeah. So yeah. the trend is, you know, you look at the uh, digital applications, uh, you can look at the uh, storage, how they're storing information, because a lot of information is mm-hmm. not stored on the phone anymore. Mm-hmm. A lot of information is now stored in the cloud. If you notice that when you look at a um, a direct messaging application, not all your chats are in that application. You literally have to pull down and it recovers some of that information because it's being stored somewhere else. So, uh, you know, that gives us more of an idea of, hey, maybe this is not all the information. Maybe there's more data somewhere else that we can go after and see if that may have have evidentiary value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then putting that all together, how do you you put put that all together? Um, Because that that seems like a lot of disparate information. Well, so, I mean, obviously, we want to see how people are communicating, the victims uh, with the suspects, the suspects with possibly other co-conspirators. 
Uh, we want to see how they're, especially when it comes to human trafficking. You know, the way I always look at things is, you know, what's what's the crime that's being committed? I look at the elements of the crime, and then I look for evidence that supports those elements of a crime. Yeah. So when we look at human trafficking, you're looking at harboring, enticing, uh, advertising, and all those things come into play when I'm looking for data. I'm like, well, what will provide me evidence to support that statute? Um, so by looking at that, I'll start looking at these direct messaging applications. I'll look at their web history. I'll look at their email uh, and see if there's anything of, of that evidentiary value. And then I'll see if there's anything uh, with their digital currency on there. You know, how are they getting money to go on uh, for transportation, things like that. So there's a lot of good information that we can get from these applications. And we can also find out if other uh, platforms are being utilized, whether it be cloud services or anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I think um, patterns of life is a phrase that's been coming up more and more frequently in recent years um, uh, with regard to the amount, not just the amount of data, but um, the, the way that it can all be put together, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So I think we all know uh, that digital forensics is a toolbox approach, um, especially in these very complex cases that you, you work um, yourself. What are some of the forensic applications you utilize for your investigations? Well, to go back a little bit, and I'll kind of explain how I got involved with digital forensics. Uh, back in 2013, uh, my department was outsourcing all the digital forensic work. Um, but there was a long turnaround time and yeah. we would get stuff back, but we wouldn't know how to analyze the data. Sometimes, uh, you know, the other agencies had had uh, a large backlog. So it would be very difficult during our cases to number one, make that, uh, you know, that 21 day filing period that we would have with mm -hmm. a lot of our cases. And then, you know, when the cases go to trial, you know, did we have the digital evidence at that point to go ahead and use those as exhibits? So we transitioned to not only uh, outsourcing, but allowing us to bring all that stuff in-house by uh, training some of our detectives. We actually created a digital forensic program, which has been very successful. Mm -hmm. And now we have approximately, I think, uh, four digital forensic examiners at my department. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing very well since 2013. Uh, with that being said, uh, we use several applications uh, to do uh, forensics. Uh, we use stuff like, uh, you know, industry standards like uh, Magnet Forensics Axiom, fantastic tool, uh, Celebrate Products, fantastic tool, uh, Oxygen Forensics. And I've always realized that even with the different tools that we use, there's no one answer to anything. Right. Uh, you know, each program uh, decodes differently. Each program parses out data differently. And we're constantly playing catch up with these applications that are being put out. The operating systems are updating so fast now. There's usually updates every every couple of weeks, if not months. Uh, the applications itself are changing constantly. So if one's not supporting it, maybe the other one will. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon for us to uh, load these uh, after we do an extraction, uh, pull that data into multiple applications and kind of see what we have. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like trying to go to a doctor for a second opinion. You know, you yeah. want to look at the data and then wait a minute, let me see how this other program does it. Maybe it's going to parse out differently. Mm -hmm. So having said all that, is there one particular tool that stands out to you um, in terms of um, the features that it has? And, and if so, where have those features helped the most? So uh, I'm, I'm a good proponent for all three. But however, the one I, I tend to utilize the most is Oxygen Forensics. Okay. Uh, and the reason being is that the analytical tools are very easy for me to understand. Um, I can do things more efficiently in a timely manner and then be able to present that in a way that other people can understand as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the greatest tools I think with Oxygen Forensics is that I don't wanna to have to keep loading and unloading applications or not applications, but extractions or images, image files. If you know with some of the other applications, you gotta you load once, but then you gotta either uh, cancel out your, uh, your extraction or import another one. And it's a tedious process. Mm -hmm. Well, what Oxygen allows me to do is import uh, a numerous amount of extractions and then put them under or categorize them under a case number. And I can look at them in, in uh, I guess, almost as a whole. So let's say I get one case that has five or six phones or even other uh, digital evidence. Well, I can kind of look at them all together mm -hmm. and not have to go back and forth. And it makes my life a lot easier. Yeah, that it, it sounds like um, that definitely would. I mean, um, I, I know um, 
one of the of the issues that also keeps coming up a lot is backlog, right? And, and efficiency. And it's, it sounds like that um, really helps to streamline in that regard. Um, I know uh, you mentioned a little bit ago about being able to um, communicate with other stakeholders. What are some of your biggest challenges with those stakeholder communications and how does Oxygen support communicating with them? I guess particularly with prosecutors, but also across agencies. Okay, so uh, obviously in the forensic process, uh, there's different stages of it. Obviously we do our you know, identification of the devices, we do our uh, extractions or imaging of the devices, analytics, and then we do our reports. And it, while we're working on it, it's pretty easy to talk about, but it's you know, when these cases either go to trial or we're going through trial preparation or we're preparing for discovery, sometimes the recall is a little harder. Mm -hmm. So with the uh, reports that we're able to create through Oxygen, it makes a little bit easier to recall that information and understand it better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with a lot of the uh, reports that we make, obviously you'll have your uh, original evidence, which we call like questioned evidence. And then you have your uh, master copy of the evidence and then you have your working copy. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people, we start with our working copy and then based on that, we start doing our queries and then we start making our analytical reports. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the reports that we find in Oxygen are very easy to understand. Uh, whether it be PDF or CSV or Excel format, whatever, or HTML, those formats, when you see how the data is presented, it's easy for me to explain that to other officers or agents or uh, attorneys when they come, not only for prosecution, but defense attorneys when we go through mm -hmm. like uh, evidence review. Mm -hmm. Which, um, I, I mean, in the complex cases that you work, um, I, I want to come back to that um, in, in terms of, um, can you give any examples of how that um, that would work in, in an especially complex case? Well, uh, uh, so in, in a lot of our cases, especially with the trafficking, you're going to have, uh, you could have multiple suspects, you can have multiple victims, it could be all uh, crossing over state lines, county lines, um, it could be, you know, in other countries, and then you'll have a lot of digital evidence. The evidence can be uh, cellular phones, it could be tablets, it could be call detail records, it can be um, uh, social media platforms where all the data is not on the phone, where it's being stored in the cloud somewhere. So all this information has to be able, you have to be able to uh, bring it to one spot and then review all the data almost like separately, but together and look for patterns. Yeah. And by using this application it allows me to do that because I can look for things and do search queries uh, over a, a, a group of information and not just in one singular thing. So maybe not just one cell phone, but I'm looking for maybe a communication between two people over a variety of uh, not only phones, but platforms that they're using. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a lot easier for me and I can explain it easier for to other people when I find that data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of on that note, um, child exploitation and human trafficking obviously have continued to escalate, especially throughout the pandemic. Uh, what do you think is the most important capability Oxygen has to support you in dealing with uh, these case volumes and data volumes? So uh, going back to a, a point I made before, importing these uh, into or categorizing uh, the extractions into, I guess, under a case file. Okay. Uh, and a lot of other applications that I have, it's great. The tools are fantastic. Uh, and, and I can't say enough for Celebrate and, Ox and Oxium, but um, when I have multiple phones and I can categorize them under one case number, mm -hmm. uh, that information kind of gets stored on a separate drive. And I don't have to constantly recall that information. I can, uh, as soon as I launch the application, those files are already there. So I can literally have 65, 70 phones open mm -hmm. and categorized under the same case number mm -hmm. and go and refer back to that at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's easy when you're jumping around to different cases. We don't just work on one case. We're constantly yeah, working on yeah. multiple cases. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're assisting other uh, officers or agents. They want to review their data. So you don't have to spend time waiting for it to reload uh, over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Lee, uh, thank you again for joining us on the Forensic Focus podcast. Oh, thank you for having yeah, me. Absolutely. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcript along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well. Mm -hmm.